All right, thank you very much for the uh, opening prayer and the doxology. Let's turn our Bibles. Uh, we'll start with Luke uh, chapter 6, uh, excuse me, chapter 22, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 6. And as we continue to note our Lord's uh, Passion Week, we find ourselves in Luke chapter uh, 22 at the very uh, uh, beginning of it, where we're recognizing Judas Iscariot's uh, plan of betrayal against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And my computer is pausing. Let's see what's going on. Uh, but in that, uh, we noted verse 1, and we talked about uh, the time frame in which this betrayal plan began, two days before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also called the Passover. And then as we get into verse 2, we recognize that there were other characters involved, the Pharisees uh, and the scribes, and really, it, uh, as it said, the chief priests were involved in that. And they were uh, part and parcel in making the plan. They're the ones who wanted to bring about the uh, destruction of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and actually kind of put out a hit on Jesus Christ, uh, let the people know that if anybody turns him in or bumps him off, that they would be uh, well compensated, as we've recognized and noted. And now as we uh, uh, get into verse 3, we're recognizing a fourth character that is involved. Not only Judas Iscariot, the chief priests, and also uh, the scribes, again the Jewish leadership, but now we see another individual being involved, and that individual is Satan himself. And in this passage, we're noting and recognizing how Satan possessed the body of Judas Iscariot at the time of putting the plan together to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, actually entered into him, possessed the body, made sure that G uh, Judas didn't get cold feet, and then changed his mind about what he was going to do. And therefore, we see Satan himself possessing the body of Judas. But again, Judas uh, wanting to do these things on his own as he had turned against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for whatever reason, uh, form, or fashion. He turned against him in the heart of his soul, opening up his heart as an unbeliever for demonic possession. Satan then enters in and makes sure the deed gets done of putting a plan together to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then as we are going to see as we get further into chapter 22, Satan possesses him during the Passover supper once again to make sure that the deed gets done there in the actual plan of betrayal where he would lead then the Pharisees and their cohorts of uh, uh, guards and also uh, Roman guards as well to find Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and identify Jesus uh, at that dark hour of night. So therefore he could be arrested and then you know the rest of the story from there. So Satan made sure that the deed got done both in the planning and then actually in the fulfillment of the plan, in the execution of the plan, in the betrayal of our Lord at the hands of Judas Iscariot. So in regard to this, as we've been noting uh, in Luke chapter 22, let's read that and then we'll get into uh, our topic of study this morning, which is really talking about Satan himself. Now in verse uh, uh, chapter 22 and verse 1, Again, it says, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, again, how they were uh, seen as synonymous uh, feasts and festivals, was approaching. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Again, they wanted to do it uh, in a clandestine form or fashion, in secret, as we know, because Jesus had many followers, up to thousands of men and women were following him at that point in time. And if they saw him being arrested out in the daylight in front of them, the Pharisees were afraid of the rebellion of the people against them and then overturning their authority and power uh, that they had over the people. Now in verse 3, And Satan entered Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. So again, one of the twelve that Jesus Christ had as his disciples, as he uh, picked, as he began his ministry, this one turned against him. In verse 4, And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. And we talked about that and the coins of silver that he received as a result. And he cons uh, consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart 
from the multitude. So even Judas Iscariot was in on the plan. Let's not do this in the daylight or in front of people. How can we do this in the hiding, in the shadows, in the mystery, under the cover of darkness? How can we do this so no one else knows about it at the time of it occurring? Judas went along with that wholeheartedly and then fulfilled that plan as we're going to see later on in this chapter. But uh, as we're recognizing here back in verse 3, we're seeing the demonic possession of Judas Iscariot at the hands of Satan himself. And so as we get into this right now, we're talking about Satan. We're seeing a little bit about him. We're understanding who and what he is from Scripture. We'll get more into that this evening or this morning. Then we're going to talk about demonic possession and what that means and how that occurs and uh, the uh, importance of that in the time of Jesus and throughout human history. And then we'll also uh, get into a little bit about Judas Iscariot himself uh, as a, a, a disciple of Jesus, and then we'll see the end result of Judas Iscariot as well as he regretted uh, doing this to Jesus and then took his own life. So we'll talk all about that in the coming days and I'm sure weeks as well. But today we're going to be talking about Satan. We call this the doctrine of Satan. And in regard to that, we're talking about the uh, second point that we have in this doctrine. Uh, that is understanding the person of Satan himself. As we noted on Thursday night, we talked about the different names or titles of Satan that we have throughout Scripture. He is known as the devil. He is known as Satan predominantly. But there are many, many other titles that have been given for him throughout Scripture. And in all of them, we recognize that we do not know the true name of Satan himself. Like we know the name of Michael the Archangel or Gabriel the Archangel, that has been given to us in Scripture. We do not know the literal name of this individual uh, 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 directly from Scripture. There's some conjecture as to what it is, but all of the titles that are given for him that we use as names are really just adjectives describing who and what he is and how he functions and how he operates. So that's really what we see in regard regard to the naming of Satan slash the devil throughout Scripture. They're all just titles of who he is and how he functions and operates and not his real name. And we can kind of understand that in regard to his rebellion against God in the eternal state and God not wanting to honor him in the human race by giving us his name and lifting him up on high in that fashion. But instead, he just gives us titles and understanding in regard to who and what he is. And that's all we really need to know because we know that he is our enemy. He is the one that is the enemy of God. He's the enemy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's the enemy of the cross. He's the enemy of the church, as we're going to be noting. And I'll give you scripture for those in just a minute. But in any case, he is our great adversary, our great enemy. And so therefore, in order to overcome our enemy, again, we're not going to defeat the enemy. We can overcome the enemy, but we cannot defeat the enemy and we don't have to because he's already been defeated at the cross but to overcome our enemy it's good to know about our enemy just as if you want to overcome anything in life you need to know more about it and the evil behind it uh, so that you can overcome it and then therefore be victorious within your own soul and not be overcome by sin and Satan and his cosmic system. So that's why we're delving into this uh, study of Satan himself and understanding a little bit more uh, from Scripture as to who and what he is so that we can get a better grasp and understanding of him and his tactics as well so that we can be aware of them. The first thing we need to keep in mind is that he is a created being. Just as much as you and I are created beings by God, so too is Satan. There is nothing extra special about this individual, and certainly he is not like God. He was created in eternity past by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was created, as we know from Scripture, before the restoration of planet Earth, as we see the restoration of planet Earth in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and going forward, the book of Isaiah 24, and also in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 and 26. And specifically, that Jeremiah passage is interesting because it kind of is a discussion of the destruction of earth 
at the end of the tribulational time period so that is reconstituted for the millennial reign. But uh, it kind of goes off on a tangent as many of the scriptures do and it kind of ports us back into the time period when God had created the heavens and the earth. And that's one thing we need to understand that well before mankind was placed here on planet earth, God had already created the heavens and the earth. But yet the heaven and especially the earth became formless and void. In other words, there was a great society, a great animal and plant life that was here on planet earth prior to what we read about starting in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 2 and then the other scriptures I gave you. And we don't have any idea as to what was here prior to that other than what we may be finding in the fossil records that we can recognize the dinosaurs and all those types of things. Even though some people think the dinosaurs were alive during the time period of uh, Adam and uh, going forward. But I don't see how Jurassic Park could live and exist along with members of the human race. Again, we would just be devoured, wouldn't we? By all those raptors and everything else, the T-Rexes running around everywhere. So again, we see that as a prehistoric uh, time period. And again, there was a time period, and who knows what else was on planet Earth as far as kingdoms and societies and things like that from the angelic realm. Not from a human realm, but from an angelic realm during that time. And there's other scriptures, another uh, doctrine, another study for another day. A lot of scriptures that talk about Satan and his prior kingdoms and the angelic realms that are out there in our stellar universe as well that we have absolutely no idea of and how they are constituted, how they're made up, and the majesty and the glory that we could see there. But uh, believe you me, the angelic realm and the angelic race has had many kingdoms and worlds throughout our universe that they have occupied and and probably continue to do so today. Planet Earth was one of those and probably uh, the, uh, the great playground for Satan himself. This must have been a prized possession of him. But as the result of his rebellion, then God made the Earth formless and void. And prior to the Earth being uh, made formless and void, we see the rebellion of Satan in eternity past. So again, sometime uh, between the creation of the heavens and the earth and then it becoming formless and void because of the rebellion of Satan, somewhere along in that time period that we don't even think about as time, Satan was created by God. Again, we don't have all the details there, but we have enough information to give us generality, but we absolutely know that these things did occur. As we look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, let's turn there in our Bibles. Let's go to Ezekiel 28. We'll spend a little time uh, there. Because there are two really main passages of the Old Testament that tell us a little bit about Satan in his prior state and then also in regard to his fall. And again, to give you a, a quick little memory jog, uh, for those of you that uh, uh, may be new or haven't uh, uh, been with us for some time, but in Ezekiel 28, we see the storyline of Satan and his fall. And then if you split 28 in half and you get to verse four, uh, chapter 14, think of Isaiah chapter 14. Because Ezekiel 28 tells us about Satan, and then split that in half, and you get to Isaiah chapter 14, and that also gives us another understanding of who and what Satan is. When we come back on Tuesday night, we're going to spend a little bit of time in Isaiah 14, but today we're going to focus on uh, Ezekiel chapter 28 and verses 11 through 19. But what we recognize first and foremost is the word creation in the Hebrew in regard to Satan himself is the word bara that uh, comes from the Hebrew language. And it's an interesting word because it is used in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and the other chapters and passages that I have up on the board speaking about the creation of the heavens and the earth in its original form and state, and then speaking about the creation of mankind, especially in regard to the soul that God gave to mankind and his act of creation. It comes from the, the Greek word bara, and that word bara, actually from the Latin uh, ex nihilio, means to create something out of nothing. And this is where we understand that Jesus Christ spoke into existence the heavens and the earth. 
Jesus Christ spoke into existence uh, mankind and certainly the soul that resides inside of mankind. So again, creating something out of nothing is what the word bara means in the Hebrew language. If I've said Greek before, excuse me for that, but it's from the Hebrew language. All right, so from the Hebrew language, we get that understanding. And this word is used for the creation of Satan, that he was created out of nothing, and God spoke him into existence. And again, that's why we recognize the total arrogance that Satan must have within his soul to think that the one that created him, that he could be just like him and be equal on par with him and be divorced from him throughout his life. Just as mankind, who is very arrogant as unbeliever, thinking they don't need a God, they don't need a Savior, they don't have a Creator. When yet, every single one of us has a creator and a savior. And how arrogant is it to, to rebel against that individual? One thing for mankind who isn't in the physical presence of that God each and every day. But think about Satan. And we don't know how long the time period was. The eons that might have passed, millions of years, potentially where Satan was in the presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, praising and worshiping Him year after year, millennial after millennial. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing that he could then rebel against Him and think that he could be as good as Him. But unfortunately, that's what arrogance does to the soul. It gets us to be blinded to the truth that is in our life. It gets us to be blinded to our God, to our Lord, and to our Savior, and gets us focused on ourself and what we think we deserve or what we should have or what we desire and what we do lust for. And that's exactly what happened to Satan in eternity past. He desired and lusted for the glory, the power, the honor, and the ecstasy of who and what Jesus Christ is and who God the Father is. And he wanted that for himself. And he wanted it so bad that he rebelled against his Creator and then also later who would become his Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. So... Again, recognizing all of that, let's read in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verses 11 through 19. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now, even though it talks about a lamentation, again, a a sorrowful psalm, as it were, against this king of Tyre. Some people pronounce it uh, Tyre. Uh, I say Tyre. doesn't matter, really. But in any case, even though this is against that specific king, which was a railing judgment against that individual, we see the duality of this lamentation when it, in fact, then turns to the person of Satan himself. And we see similar types of analogies in regard to this when we talk about the Son of David being our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. So even though it says, say to the king of Tyre, it does not mean this is just to that one human person, because the descriptions that we're going to see here will not fit any member of the human race as we recognize and understand. And there's only one other individual that can recognize, and that is Satan himself. So here's what it says. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And the first thing that it says, you had the seal of perfection. This unbelieving king of Tyre, okay, was not a perfect individual. He was a sinner. He was an unbeliever, just as every other member of the human race is brought into the world without that perfection as a sinner and needing salvation. And it's not until somebody becomes a believer and accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that they receive the perfection of God and the seal of perfection upon their soul. But yet Satan did. Satan had this first, and he was created perfect, just as Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden were created perfect. And then as Adam and the woman fell, so too did Satan fall prior to their fall. So again, having the seal of perfection at his beginning, at his creation, we recognize and understand that. And a man, other than 
Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and Jesus Christ, no other member of the human race was created perfect, but yet Satan was. And again, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So we see that he was a very intelligent individual and that he was a beautiful individual. And again, a little bit of sucking up. Not only are you an intelligent man, but you're a handsome man too. <laughs> Do you remember that from that uh, movie, whatever that was? Okay. <laughs> Not only are you a handsome man, but you're intelligent too. All right, so that's Satan himself. All right, he had all of this. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, Adam and the woman were in the Garden of Eden, and no one else was. So we're not talking about Adam here because he still doesn't live. And Adam, or excuse me, the king of Tyree is not the reincarnation of Adam from the Garden of Eden. There was only one other character that we saw in prominence in the Garden of Eden, and that was what? The serpent being Satan himself. So again, right there it points to Satan. It says every precious stone. I love this. This is pretty cool. I can't wait to see this in the eternal state. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the lapsa lazuli, and turquoise, and the, uh, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings in sockets was in you on the day that you were created. Again, bara, the day that you were out of nothing, brought into something, the day that you were created. So right there it tells us that the body of Satan was created out of gems. And rather than having joints and ligaments as we do, or the bone structure that we do, his was made out of gold, okay? And that's what held all these various gems together. So again, a fascinating type of creature made out of gems, as it were. And again, whenever we think of the devil, we just think of the red epidermis, the horns sticking up in the you know, pitchfork tail or whatever the case may be, okay? We think of Satan being that individual, but yet he was absolutely gorgeous with these gems uh, making up uh, the body that he resided in. Now, again, if you want to say, well, that's not the body, this was just a breastplate that he wore because... Remember the high priest of Israel? They would wear a breastplate, okay? And so again, that was the fitting in the sockets. This too could have an analogy for the high priest who wore that breastplate, who was the leader of worship and uh, a, a service for the people of Israel in the worship of God. Because Satan had these same gems uh, adorned on him, he too was the leader of worship of all the angels to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to our God. And fascinating, a little, uh, a couple of little facts in associated with this is that these nine gems that are mentioned here are also found in the breastplate of the high priest of Israel, although there's only nine here, the high priest had 12. And remember, one for each of the tribes of Israel. So they had 12 which talks about perfect human uh, uh, government as well. Do you know what the number nine means throughout Scripture? It means judgment. So it's kind of interesting. As he was created, God knew that he was going to rebel, had the nine stones adorned upon him, and again, speaking about the judgment that he too would face. All right, so a little bit of trivia there at the end. But uh, again, this beautiful adorned type of creature with these types of uh, diamonds and emeralds and all kinds of gems uh, adorning him, all of them too would do what? Reflect the glory of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because when you take any one of these types of uh, uh, stones and you have good light coming to it, the light just bounces off, it is reflected, but it's reflected in the various colors and beauty of that stone. And so when we get, I'm going off some tangents here, when we get to our resurrection body, remember our resurrection body in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as star differs from star, we're not going to be emanating our own light. We're going to be reflecting the light of uh, Jesus Christ. We're going to be reflecting the glory of God for all of eternity. And if we are doing the will of God throughout our life, we are going to be like the sun or the moon in its reflecting or its intensity of light. And it says a star differs from star. If we're not doing the will of God, we're going to be a faint little tiny light uh, in the eternal state. But given the description here of Satan, 
is that resurrection body also going to be adorned with gems as well? Again, a little just conjecture there, but again, we will see. We know Jesus Christ in the transfiguration as he em, uh, emanated and reflected his resurrection body in uniform of glory, as we call it. What will that resurrection body be like and made up of that reflects the glory of God uh, for all of eternity? So, again, some kind of interesting things to think about when we get to the eternal state. Coming back into Satan now in verse 14, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers. And remember in the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, they had the two angels that they would adorn on that. And they were bowing down and their wings came forward. Those were called cherub angels. And they were guarding what? The mercy seat, which was the throne of Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. So again, as he was the covering cherub, he too was the one in eternity eternity past that was leading the worship and service and the throne of God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and leading all the other angelic realm in the praise and the worship and the glorification of who and what he uh, Jesus is and who and what God our Father and the Holy Spirit is all about and that covering cherub too he might have had some kind of responsibility too to keep everybody in line as well if this one's going off or that one's going off, you've got to get them back in line and get them back into the truth and the understanding of the worship of God. He covered, okay? He covered that. The anointed cherub who covers. It says, and I placed you there. I gave you that authority. I gave you that power. Not only did I create you, but I gave you all these things. It says, you were on the holy mountain of God. And again, the king of Tyree, you know, absolutely did not qualify in any of these descriptions, but we see that Satan does. Then it says, you walked in the midst of the stones of fire. And this is kind of interesting, too. Again, the midst of the stones of fire, God's holiness made up of his righteousness and his justice. So this gives us a little bit of an understanding of who and what Jesus Christ is as our great judge. And in the prior state, the judge over the angelic race as well. So he is the great judge of mankind. He is the great judge of the angelic race. Walking in the midst of the stones of fire has a connotation of the judgment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this says walking in the midst means a close personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, you can just imagine about that relationship that they had, the friendship that they had, you know, for many uh, years or millennial or eons, whatever the case may be. And now your best friend turning upon you is what's in view here, where Satan turned on Jesus Christ. Just as Judas Iscariot, who walked with him for three years, is now turning against him and betraying him. We see Satan doing that in eternity past as well. Now in verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Again, bara once again, until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. Again, from the third heaven in God's throne room. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. From the midst of the stones of fire. So the judgment that came against him in eternity past. It says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by means of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade. You profaned your sanctuaries. This is kind of interesting. Your sanctuaries. And again, when I talked about all those different realms and kingdoms that uh, exist potentially in the uh, uh, stellar universe for the angelic race, all the different sanctuaries that were out there that were places of worship of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that he had authority and rulership over to bring people in that worship or the angelic realm, we should say, in the worship of God. Again, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth. In the eyes of all who see you, 
all who know you among the people are appalled at you. You have become terrified and you will be no more. So all of that talks about the sin that cropped up in the soul of Satan, how then it led him into the rebellion and the continued sin that he went, the, uh, the uh, destruction of the sanctuaries that he had authority over in regard to how he stopped in that worship of God, let other, led other angels to rebel against God as well. He corrupted all those sanctuaries, those places of worship. He probably established them as some for himself to be worshipped himself. Just as all in the ancient days we see all the pagan gods and goddesses that uh, the Babylonians had, the Assyrians had, the Greeks had, and the Romans had. All of those false gods, as we've studied in the past, had a fallen angel behind them. And behind that is Satan leading all of that. In ultimately, if man were to worship the false gods, they were worshiping uh, one of the fallen angels, and then therefore they would be worshiping Satan himself. Just as on Thursday I showed you how the Antichrist, being possessed by Satan at that time, would be worshipped as people worship the Antichrist. So... Again, Satan bringing about all of that, uh, profaning all of that, uh, going against all of that. The anger, the bitterness, the jealousy, the hatred just overtook his soul uh, because of the arrogance within his soul. And the arrogance especially towards the one that created him and gave him the power and authority to do and be who he was. So, in any case, all of that came crashing down. He uh, became corrupted in the mentality of his soul. So, what we recognize is that Satan did not evolve or bring himself into being. Satan is not God, and he is not a God, okay? There's only one God, and all the other gods that man worships, or even the fallen angelic realm may worship, are false gods. They are not gods. He did not evolve. He did not uh, create himself. He did not come into a, a being. At the same time, he is not an eternal being as well. He is created, just as I said, you and I have been created by our God. So when we think about that, again, it helps us to recognize that we do have an eternal God. We do have an infinite God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God, a loving God, a gracious God. When we think about our God and who He is and the eminence of who and what He is, it trumps who and what Satan is time and time again because He's just a created being. He is just created as you and I are created. Yes, he has a little bit more power and authority and wisdom that you and I have now. As the Bible says, the angels are a little bit higher than us today. But when we get to the eternal state in our resurrected body because of our union with Jesus Christ, we will be higher than the angels. We will be judging angels. I kind of find that interesting. Why would we need to judge a perfect race in the future? It's kind of interesting when you think about that. Why do we need to judge angels? Well, there's not going to be sin in the eternal state, but maybe there's some spats that come up every now and again between, I want that wing, no, you get that wing, okay? I want a blue wing, no, I want a green wing, okay? Then we got to come in and say, no, you get the blue one, you get the green one, okay? And you're good, okay, go forward. All right, but again, why are we going to judge angels in a perfect environment and society for all of eternity? There's going to be some stuff that God has us do. We'll find more about that. But in any case, you know, he is a created being. And he is a little bit higher than us. Certainly he is more powerful than we are uh, in our humanity. But when you have the word of God resonant within your soul and you are filled with the Holy Spirit and going forward with the plan of God, you've got a greater power now in you and working through you than Satan and his cosmic system and all of it combined. That's why we can be overcomers. That's why we can be victorious experientially and uh, in our daily walk or tactically 
in our daily walk. Positionally, you are already an overcomer. Positionally, you have Christ indwelling you, the Father, the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Trinity are indwelling you. You've been given the seal of perfection. You have perfect and holy righteousness inside of you. Satan and the fallen angels don't have any of that power. They've got their created power endued upon them by God, but they don't have God's power in them like you and I do. And that's why we can be overcomers. And that's why we need the power of God in us. And that's why, you know, as George uh, opened up in our prayer uh, service today and the evil that is being taught, evil's always been taught throughout the world, and we're seeing it being taught, you know, in our day and age as well. The cosmic system has always been teaching evil uh, to our children, always been teaching evil to our people and trying to overcome them. No different than today, okay? We just may not be uh, 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 as used to hearing about it in our society because we did have a righteous society. We still do have somewhat of a righteous uh, society, but we're seeing evil being more empowered each and every day. But it's always been there. But even though it's always been there, we've got a greater power called God and His Word, our Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got that greater power inside of us to overcome whatever the world can throw at us. And believe you me, you know, over the last, uh, you know, uh, weeks and uh, uh, years or whatever, again, you've seen it and I've seen it. And we see the tactics of Satan coming into our lives. Sometimes it's an all-on assault and it's a big problem or a big difficulty. But most of the time, and again, depending on uh, who and what you are, but a lot of times you can, you know, you see the big train coming, and you're like, all right, that's a big train coming. I know what it is. I'm prepared. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, get the Word of God, and I'm going to be able to handle this. But when we get knocked off is when it's a little bit of this. A little pick, a little peck, a little pick over here, a little prick over there, a little peck, 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 peck. And before you know it, the pecks overwhelm your soul, and then you blow it, okay? Or you lose it. Or sometimes the peck, peck, pecks can be so subtle that you're blinded to the little pecks that are coming along. And before you know it, you're not walking with Christ anymore and you're not being filled with the Holy Spirit as you were previously. So we've got to be careful and conscious of our enemy. We've got to be careful and conscious of the big train and the big onslaught that's barreling you know, down the tracks headlong into us. But we've also got to be prepared for the little pick, little pick, little prick, little pick, little talk. What, oh, TikTok. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, watch out for those things, right? <laughs> All right, you got to be careful of those things, okay? And watch out for those things because they are designed by Satan and his cosmic system to lead you astray. But the fact of the matter is, regardless of what they design, regardless of their wisdom and their power and their authority, regardless of uh, the overwhelming odds that it seems that they have within our society, Remember, they're already defeated. They've already lost. And they lost because of the strategic victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. That will be culminated in the eternal lake of fire one day. But they've already lost. And oh, by the way, you have greater power in you to overcome whatever they're trying to throw at you or do to you or try to influence you. You have greater power in you. But now you've got to do what? Use your free will volition to tap into that power. You've got to use the mentality of your soul to say yes for the things of God and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and say no to the temptations of sin that are in our life constantly each and every day. You've got to use your volition because that's how God designed us as volitional uh, people. Satan was created with a free will volition. He could choose to follow God. He could choose to rebel against God. Unfortunately, he chose to ultimately rebel. Adam and the woman, even though in a perfect environment, created in perfection, they had free will. Choose for God or choose against God. They chose initially against God. Then they came back around and chose for God. You and I were brought into this world uh, as enemies of God with our free will volition. We chose to follow God. We chose to accept and receive our Savior and, uh, and uh, believe in our Creator God as well. 
Now that you've made that decision, continue to make good decisions each and every day with that free will volition that God has given to you so that you make good, wise decisions to follow God, be led by God, worship God, serve God, make Him the most important thing in your life each and every day because the enemy does not want you to do that. The enemy wants you to be involved in this thing or that thing, the pleasures of life, the lust and the mentality of the sin nature that come uh, out of our soul. The enemy does not want you to have a relationship with God. The enemy does not want you to walk in the midst of the fiery stones in heaven, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. doesn't want you to have that relationship. But again, they don't have the power to make you do things. Okay, They have the power to influence you, but not to make you do anything. So therefore, as, especially as a believer, so therefore use that free will volition to take in the word so that you have more power and strength in your soul to overcome them. Because in our humanity alone, we are defeated by them. We will be defeated by them if we try to do it on our own. But with the Word of God, we have greater power inside of us. And again, that's what Ephesians chapter 6 is all about. Pick up and put on the full armor of God. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against members of the human race. You know, you can't be pointing your finger at Iran or Iraq or, you know, this country or uh, this president or that president. You can't point your finger and say, that's our problem. No, our problem is Satan and his cosmic system. And it becomes a problem for us when we follow that cosmic system. You see, if we follow the Word of God in our relationship with God, it's not a problem. It's not a problem because we've got the strength and the power and all the resources necessary to overcome whatever they want to throw our way. So again, he was a created individual. He has great power. Uh, he had a, a, the, the choice to, uh, between good and evil, but unfortunately, he chose for evil. And as a result of that degenerating uh, evil that he chose to follow and the power of sin within our life, he is a completely different person today than he was at the po a point of his creation. Now, be interested to see if he gets stripped of all that beautiful gold and all the gems or everything like that, or if that's still the body that he's in. Be interested to see that, if he gets stripped of all of that. He's certainly a different person in the mentality of his soul. That's what's the most important. And as, even as we see today, you know, you know, the greatest people in our society, usually the beautiful people, okay, or the rich and the powerful people, and they have all this wealth and prestige and all this glitz and glam. And we say, oh, isn't that a wonderful person? And we look at that, and we all want to attain to that. We want the wealth, and we want the riches, and we want the prestige. But then you really find out about the person, you say, boy, that person's really a w wicked, rotten individual, aren't they? Okay? You know, occasionally they are good people, and they are believers. We get that, okay? But the predominance is, they're not a very good person. So again, Satan started out as a perfect individual and a perfect being in a great worship and service and love for God. But he turned. And now the arrogance within his soul has so changed him, the sin within his soul has so changed him that he cannot be recognized as regard to the person that he once was. And so again, think about that in our lives as well, in the lives of people that you may know, you know, and especially the believers who started out in the Word of God and yet turned because of sin or Satan or something else in their life. And you look at them today and you say, they're not the person I once knew. They're not the person they once were. Because you see the debilitating and the uh, degenerating process that sin has within our lives. So therefore, that's why we have to fight against sin so that we too aren't changed in the mentality of our soul and become a different person than what we were. And now... Again, as a believer, let's continue to go forward in the plan of God. Let's grow more and more in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ each and every day and continue to be the person that God designed us to be, walking in holiness and righteousness, making good decisions each and every day rather than walking in sin and evil and wickedness. As we recognize, again, he was the highest ranking of all the angels. Again, the sanctuaries that he profaned. He was the ruler over them. Now he's just the ruler over a portion of them. 
And again, we don't know exactly the numbers of angels that exist, both fallen and elect. And remember, angels, as far as we know, have not, the fallen angels have not been zapped out of existence, okay? As far as we know, they, whatever God created in the angelic race, they all still exist. And we have some clue from the book of Revelation that Satan with his great tail swept away one-third of the stars, which means we think that one-third of the angelic race stayed in rebellion with him. Again, we'll find out exactly when we get to the eternal state, but we think it's one-third and two-third uh, then uh, repented if they did fall and now uh, continue to reside as elect angels with God. But Satan once was the ruler over all the angels. Now he's just a ruler over one-third of the angels. So again, you see a little bit of a demotion there as well. Again, recognizing that in the book of Ezekiel, the book of Matthew, uh, and then also in the book of Luke as well. We're going to see, uh, 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 let's go to uh, Luke chapter 11. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. So I've just got a few more minutes left. We started a little late, and running a little bit over, but we'll just get this in. But as we've noted, he was called the anointed cherub. Again, he was the anointed one. So having great uh, 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 power and authority and prestige, just as David was the anointed king of Israel by God, Saul was not, David was. Just as Jesus Christ is the anointed one, the Savior, the Messiah, and just as you and I are anointed, and we are the anointed children of God. Because again, uh, he has given us his favor, he has given us a great blessing, and he has given us great power and authority as well. He was the anointed cherub, the anointed cherub angel, the leader of all. And therefore, he had the highest position of all of them. But today, we recognize there's what we call seraphim angels. Now, cherubim angels have four wings. And as far as we know from e in eternity past, that was the highest ranking angel four wings, and that determined their rank. Now we have six-winged angels that seem to be lead angels in the angelic realm. So we see him now below that because he's still only a four-winged angel. As we recognize in Matthew chapter 9, as uh, in, in regard to Satan's leadership over the angels, even the Pharisees recognized this. It says, but the Pharisees were saying he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And there again in Luke chapter uh, uh, 11, let's go there, in verses uh, 15 through 19, give you a little bit greater story in the Gospel of Luke, because that's our book of study. It says, but some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And now that whole Beelzebul is an interesting little study. Uh, some translate that meaning the Lord of the flies. So that's where we get that terminology from. But uh, it also uh, has to do with some ancient pagan gods and worship of uh, false gods back in the, uh, in the day. So it comes from that name as well. But outside of the Bible, again, this word was not used, okay? But the Pharisees and the people of Jesus' day had coined this term from a, 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 a false god worship back in their day. And they termed it as the leader of the fallen angelic race, as we have here, the ruler of demons. So he cast out demons by Beelzebul. And again, again, being a de derogatory uh, uh, phraseology there, but again, the ruler of the demons, again, the fallen angels. It says others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Even Satan's kingdom is not divided. In a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. We studied this out, uh, a lot of uh, other doctrinal points in there. But the point is, cast out demons by the ruler of the demons, Beelzebul, uh, is what is in view. And as Satan is saying, okay, if I'm cast, as Jesus is saying, if I'm casting out demons from these individuals and stopping their little ministry inside of that demon-possessed person, 
Isn't that counter to what I should be doing as Beelzebul or in the power of Beelzebul? Again, so why do you call me that? Why do you call me the leader of the fallen angels if I'm casting out demons and helping people and saving people? Again, uh, good logic to be applied there. And then turning it back around on them. If your sons are doing the same, you know, uh, you know, how are they doing it? Okay. And if they're doing it by God, then I am doing it by God, too. So uh, one of the points of proving his deity uh, and his authority and also being the son of God. So as we recognize in regard to Satan, uh, he was perfect. He was beautiful. Uh, again, as we uh, recognize from uh, Scripture as well, had a beautiful singing voice in the praise and worship of our God. And th so there were many, many beautiful things about this individual uh, that uh, God had created him uh, as. And he gave him power, authority, and prestige. But even with all of that, he wanted more. And again, as uh, it's kind of interesting as... Uh, you know, talk even today, but back when I was in the business world, you know, I used to talk about when is enough enough? You know, when's enough money enough? You know, is $1,000 enough or 10000 or a million or $2 million or $3 million or a billion? For some people, enough is never enough, and they just want more and more and more. And that's what sin will do to you, not being content with what you have. And for Satan, uh, you know, all that he had, it never was enough. And he still today wants more and more and more. And that's why he continues to fight, even though we're part of the appeal trial of the angelic conflict. We'll talk more about that on Tuesday. He continues to fight in rebellion, and he tries to establish what cannot be established by him. And yet he's still hell-bent on doing that, uh, hoping that he one day will be victorious. And that's what the arrogance does to the soul. It blinds you to the reality that... These things cannot happen, and enough is never enough. You need more, you need more, you need more. So as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, remember you have a power greater in you than, than he that is in the world, and therefore you have more strength, you have more uh, uh, prestige, and you have more ability, especially to be overcomers against whatever tactics and sin and temptation he may throw at you. And you also have inside of you enough so that you can be content in all and every situation. As Paul said, I knew how to be content with a lot. I knew how to be t content with a little. In all things, I knew the secret. And it is Christ in him. And that's what you and I have, Christ in us. So we should be content in all and every situation and not be on the frantic search for happiness and the lustful desire for more and more and more. We should always be content with what we have, uh, recognizing the word of God in our soul and recognizing that God has given us what he wants to give to us so that we can perform for him in the best possible way this day. And if he wants me to do more tomorrow, he'll provide more tomorrow. The next day, the next day, the next day. But for today, I'm doing what God wants me to do, and I've got everything I need for God to f from God to fulfill those things. All right, so uh, we'll close there. We'll pick it up on uh, Tuesday with uh, more understanding of the person uh, and work of Satan. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for helping us to understand our great adversary so that we are uh, prepared, and especially so that we're not overwhelmed by the thought of him, not only the things that he does, but the thought of who and what he is, recognizing that you are the creator and that you are the Savior, and you created him and saved or gave salvation opportunity for him just as you did for us. So, Father, we thank you for that and helping us to understand the reality of the angelic conflict. So, Father, we thank you and we ask that you lead us to be more powerful and faithful and strengthened by your word and by your spirit each and every day. So, Father, we thank you for this time in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right, thank you very much for that portion of our service. And now we have time to take an offering, so I'll have Deacon Barry come forward to pray for our offering. Okay, we have this Sunday and next Sunday... Uh, to pull together about $6,500.
And of course, that's not just from the people here. It's from Venmo and, uh, and people that send their checks in remotely, too. So just getting that word out. So uh, we've collected about 3500 for the month, and we need about ten grand every month. So that's that. All right, let us pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you bless this offering and all that we're able to give so that we may meet our financial obligations. In your word, the truth will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.